Fascinating fruit fly genetics reveals numerous surprises, and we open up your mail. This is Genesis Week. Welcome to this episode of Genesis Week, the weekly program of creationary commentary on news, views, and events pertaining to the Origins controversy, made possible by you, the supporters of CORE Ottawa, Citizens for Origins Research and Education. We believe God gave you an intelligently designed brain, and he expects you to use it. And obviously you are, as you came to catch this show. Excellence in pirate broadcasting, we hijack the airwaves in Canada on the Miracle Channel. Shanghai the airwaves in the U.S. through the WAC television network, commandeered satellites all around the globe, and of course, on the Christianima network on YouTube. If you get lost in cyberspace, you can just punch in wazulu.com or genesisweek.com and you can find us. And while you're there, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel to get extras like Crevo Rants and full interviews with our guests. I'm your host, Ian Juby. In our premier episode on the air last year, we discussed the stunning finds of the ENCODE project. The ENCODE project was a study of the human DNA attempting to pin down the purpose of each part of the DNA. Though previously, over 98% of the DNA was thought to be useless evolutionary leftovers, the ENCODE project determined that, in line with creationary predictions, the vast majority of the DNA had life-sustaining purpose. This turned the tables on the evolutionary paradigm and made many anti-creationists hopping mad, frankly, with some even criticizing the ENCODE team for giving the creationists ammunition. <laughs> well, we're following the science wherever it leads, aren't we? The findings of the ENCODE project were stunning. Layer upon layer of information was found all throughout the DNA. Even multiple languages written on top of the same characters. Copious genes unique to humans were found which also presented infinite problems for the evolutionary paradigm as more and more orphan genes were found. And the mythology of the evolutionary concept of junk DNA was laid to waste. The stunning complexity and design of the DNA was readily apparent. Well, now the ENCODE project has moved on to other things as well. The MOD ENCODE project. The MOD ENCODE project is the ENCODE project for model organisms. What are the old faithful model organisms used in the lab for genetic studies for who knows how long is the lowly Drosophila melanogaster the humble fruit fly. This poor fly has been bred, interbred, inbred, zapped with radiation of all types, had its genome mangled, modified, and mashed over the decades, and in the end, fruit flies have evolved into fruit flies. Even with extreme unnatural selection behind the wheel, in the form of human experimentation. The Modern Code Project released its preliminary results on the fruit fly's genetic information. The title of the resulting paper by the University of Indiana says it all. Study of complete RNA collection of fruit fly uncovers unprecedented complexity. As if DNA wasn't complicated enough already. Just like trying to reverse engineer a computer program, the mod and code team is attempting to figure out what is written in the DNA what it does, when and where. The U of I emphasized the importance of this study. The importance of Drosophila melanogaster as a model system cannot be overstated. Using it, the mechanisms of heredity were worked out about a hundred years ago. Yet in 100 years of genetic studies, listen to what the researchers are saying about the information that's come to light from this most recent study unprecedented detail, identifying thousands of new genes, transcripts, and proteins. 
The Drosophila genome is far more complex than previously suspected and suggests that the same will be true of the genomes of other higher organisms. A small set of genes used in the nervous system are responsible for a disproportionate level of complexity. Just like in the human ENCODE project, the MOD ENCODE research found that, as usual in science, we've answered a number of questions and raised even more. For example, we identified 1,468 new genes, of which 536 were found to reside in previously uncharacterized gene-free zones. While conducting the research, the researchers were able to see the influence of these controlling genes in what was previously thought to be DNA that didn't really do anything. Just like in the human DNA, it turns out that this alleged junk DNA turned out to have crucial life-supporting purpose as it controlled the DNA, which actually produced the building blocks of life. The researchers put the fruit flies through various experiments involving heat shock, cold shock, exposure to heavy metal, I mean heavy metals, a herbicide called paraquat, and even caffeine. You can imagine the behavior of a fruit fly on caffeine, but it also affected how its DNA reacted. With all of the experiments, the researchers saw over 800 genetic reactions changing how genes were expressed. So think about this. It's almost like trying to reverse engineer a computer program. Having spent 100 years developing ways in which to read the program and then trying to understand how the program worked. And even after all that time and effort, finding thousands of different tasks the program accomplishes that were previously unseen. Well, judge for yourself. Would such a computer program not demand a programmer? A designer? If we, as intelligent human beings, are struggling to reverse engineer this program, does that not imply a designer of incredible, yea, supernatural intelligence? We are struggling to understand the information contained in the DNA of the lowly fruit fly. But the same person who put that information into the fruit fly DNA also put a lot of information into our owner's manual. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm keen to understand what that hyper-intelligent being wants to tell us. The incredible attention to detail by that hyper-intelligent being is evident in the DNA programming. This is his character visible in the natural created world around us. He is also an emotional being, one who cares so much for you that he sent his only begotten son as a sacrifice for you. That's how passionate of a person he is, how much he loves you, what you mean to him. He cares about you immensely. You should read through the manual, and find what he wants to share with you. I'd recommend starting with Genesis and then the New Testament. Thank you to all of you who've supported this program with prayer, an encouraging word, and financially. I can't thank you enough. It is a lot of work producing this show, and unfortunately, it does cost a lot of money to produce the show. Even though the volunteers and myself pretty much put all of our time in for free, because we believe in the value of creation ministry. This is a viewer-supported program, and we do need financial support to keep it running. If you're Canadian, you can make a tax-deductible donation to CORE Ottawa. If you are outside of Canada and do wish to support the program, you can make a donation to CORE, or you could also donate online at enjubi.org slash donations. Just please be aware that we cannot issue tax-deductible receipts outside of Canada, and we cannot issue tax receipts to donations made through the online link. Purchases of DVDs also go towards financing the program, so any DVDs you buy from my website goes towards the expenses of the program as well. Thank you for your support in the ways that you can. Please don't stop praying for the volunteers and myself, and also the viewers who may tune in and need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Please pray that I can effectively communicate 
both the sometimes very technical science as well as the gospel. Stick around. We'll be back in one minute. The Complete Creation video series is just that, an exhaustive look at the science, philosophy, and theology behind the creation-evolution debate. In this 12-DVD series, Ian Juby starts off with a one-hour presentation for the children in God's Little Creation. He then follows up with almost 11 hours of lecturing for the adults as he walks you through the debate starting at its surprising history and examining the evidence from biology, geology, physics, paleontology, and archaeology. Chances are, any question you have about the creation-evolution debate is answered in this video series. With open captions for the hearing impaired, the series is both entertaining and educational. There are also free resources, such as question and answer and proctor sheets for homeschoolers. You can now get the entire set as an instant digital download or on DVD. Visit Ian's Bookstore today. For me? After missing a show and then not having a mailbag last week, we've got a bit of a backlog to work through here. Bogro wrote in from Colorado on Facebook. I would like to thank you for taking the time to point out what, that destructive viruses are not the norm. As for whether viruses are alive, that is still a matter of debate. As we study the intricate interplay of biology, we learn that viruses and cellular organisms are meant to function as portions of a whole. One could easily argue, therefore, that viruses are as alive as your heart or lungs. Or, to call upon a different metaphor, viruses are a part of you just as you are a part of your galaxy. The same as any star or planet. The more we understand this truth, the more we see that all of us, viruses, animals, bacteria, etc., are the work of a master builder. Thanks for writing in. Kyle from Manitoba wrote in, How do the evolutionists explain the split between plants and animals? Do they contend two primordial oozes? One that plant life came from and the other that evolved into animals? To us it seems to be an underutilized argument for creationists, since not only is it absurd to hypothesize that an elephant is related to a hummingbird, but doesn't their theory also mean that the elephant is also related to a palm tree? Thanks for writing in. First of all, yes, you hit the nail on the head. Now, I did not know the answer offhand, but took an educated guess of perhaps algae. But I was wrong. Until about 25 years ago or so, there was really only the plant and animal kingdoms. That has changed now with the advent of genetics, and as a result, bacteria, algae, and fungi have all been removed from the plant kingdom. But as for the common ancestor of the plants and animals, well, it has not become any clearer at all. Take, for instance, P.Z. Meyer's comments on his Feringula blog. After criticizing a creationist for not understanding that plants and animals are related, he then waxes eloquently in continual contradiction to ultimately say that we don't know what the common ancestor was, except that it was almost certainly single-celled. In trying to determine what that common ancestor was, he points out the many differences between plants and animals. For example, we've talked about Hox genes on the show before. Hox genes are genes which guide how other genes are used. So think of it like assembly instructions, which call upon pre-made parts to perform final assembly on a machine. The assembly instructions tell what order the parts go together and where. For instance, he says, in animals, the classic example of pattern forming genes are the Hox genes, which establish regional specifications in the early embryo. Plants have similar genes, the MADS box genes, that also set out overlapping regional identities in the growing plant. But MADS boxes and Hox genes are not homologous. Animals have MADS box genes, but don't use them in pattern formation. Plants have Hox genes, but also don't use them in pattern formation. He talks about the chromatin processes, which are also very different in plants and animals. He also goes into systems unique 
to plants or animals. Cell signaling is also radically different between the two, and in comparing the cell signaling systems between plants and animals, he says, again we find similar logic carried out by non-homologous components. Oh, careful now, PZ. Logic implies that there is a mind behind the design of plants and animals. In conclusion, PZ simply propones evolutionary assumptions. The bottom line is that plants and animals clearly rose from a common ancestor, almost certainly single-celled, and that they've evolved the processes that allow cells to cooperate and communicate and assemble into complex, elaborate entities with tissues and organs nearly completely independently. In other words, they don't know how or why plants and animals evolved, nor what they evolved from, but they clearly rose from a common ancestor. When it comes to common evolutionary ancestors, you'll notice that we can find living examples today that no evolutionist claims as a common ancestor. For example, fish were supposed to have evolved into land-walking creatures, and there's been much fuss about fossil animals that were supposed to have fit this bill. Yet there are fish today who walk on land, such as the mudskipper or the roughback batfish. No one is claiming that those fish represent the ancestor of the landwalking animal. Well, interestingly, we have an animal that's like half plant, half animal. Alicia chlorotica. Found along the eastern seaboard of North America, they are typically called a sea slug. Now, they both steal chlorophyll from the algae they eat, or they produce their own chlorophyll, which is like the blood of plants. Alicia can then obtain energy from the sun through photosynthesis, just like a plant. No one is claiming that Alicia is the common ancestor of the plants and animals. Why not? Thanks to Kyle and family for writing in. Last week we discussed the implications of the discovery that the cosmic background radiation was apparently polarized, presented as good evidence for the Big Bang. Now we got quite a boatload of response from that show. Dean's email earned him the prestigious Tyler's Tip Top Quote of the Week. Anyway, I was glad you mentioned the CMB today. It really is an interesting topic. I wish in the video, though, you would have also mentioned the extremely curious Earth-oriented structure of the CMB, such that it is aligned with our Earth's ecliptic and equinoxes. Secular scientists have dubbed this alignment the axis of evil due to its implications to random chance Big Bang models of the universe. You can read about it here. Good point. Thanks for writing in, Dean. Matt Hunt attempted to take me to task on YouTube regarding the waves and the cosmic background radiation. He's wrong from the very start. It is evidence for inflation and not the Big Bang itself. And he was talking about the Big Bang initially and certainly not inflation, so that was a lie on his part. It was done to confuse the issue. Creationists are dishonest like that. <laughs> really? Well, let's take a look at the headlines and commentary from the original report and see just who is lying and confusing the issue here. Big Bang Breakthrough Announced. Gravitational Waves Detected. This evidence could confirm our picture of the universe in the first billionths of billionths of millionths of a second after the Big Bang. Bicep 2 Telescope at South Pole finds new support for Big Bang Theory. Gravitational waves from Big Bang detected. Harvard University was involved in the research, and in their own press release, they wrote, These waves have been described as the first tremors of the Big Bang. And most importantly, let us not forget that the measurements were made of the polarized waves in the cosmic background radiation, which is described by everyone, including the Harvard press release as, and I quote, a faint glow left over from the Big Bang. Like a married couple, inflation and the Big Bang really cannot be discussed as if they are separate from one another. Now, if you want to nitpick, go for it. But your comments are logical fallacies. Ad hominem attack. You are attacking the person, not the argument. 
And if you're going to accuse me of lying or being dishonest, misleading, or deceitful, well, then you better include the press, as well as Harvard itself, seeing as how they all did exact same thing I did. Your failure to lift a finger to address any of the science I discussed, and your venturing into false accusations and ad hominem fallacies, speaks volumes. I can only conclude, then, that you have no answer to the problems I brought up for both the Big Bang and inflationary theories, which, in spite of what you insist, are obviously intrinsically married to each other. Vic wrote in, Ian, excellent video. The Real Science was very refreshing. I'm looking forward to your video on the flood. May God bless. In our Viruses and Evolution episode a few weeks back, we talked about the proper place and benefits of viruses in creation. That viruses causing sickness and disease were actually a sign of things gone wrong, a degenerate virus. We also discussed the hyperbaric biosphere experiments conducted in Glen Rose, Texas at the Creation Evidence Museum, which was an attempt to simulate the world as it was before the flood with radical, fast results, such as tripling the lifespan of fruit flies and radically altering the venom of copperhead snakes. J.R. Woods then wrote in on YouTube, Since Dr. Baugh has come up with an incredible level of new findings in his biosphere experiment, I would like to see these giant viruses as their operation and composition changes in a similar antediluvian ecosphere. There is no question they, just like the protein expression and structure of the snake venom in the same environment, as Dr. Baugh has documented in Discovery, are capable of positive benefit. My guess is, when they are placed in a double atmospheric pressure, greater oxygen, and strong magnetic field of the diamond of the Earth, these viruses would be a tremendous blessing in their function. Excellent points. Thank you for writing in. I forwarded your excellent comments to Dr. Baugh and some of his research associates. Treetail also wrote in in response to our Viruses and Evolution episode. Ian, I like how you touched on antibiotic resistance and what it means for evolution. But more, a more obvious case of apparent evolution within our own species would have been to talk about sickle cell anemia and how it lets some humans overcome malaria so that they can reach an age to be able to reproduce. This is not a case of humans already having this information, as you claimed in regards to antibiotic resistance in bacteria. Sickle cell anemia is a clear case of a mutation to benefit the human organism. You also mentioned that it is a loss of information if a large part of the population is lost. But this statement has nothing to do with the surviving bacteria. They have a changed genetic code which any change is always a gain in information. See information theory. Excellent question. Thank you for writing in. Now, this is more complicated than it seems at first. If you go to the doctor and he diagnoses you with sickle cell anemia, I assure you he will not be discussing the benefits of the disease with you. Sickle cell anemia is a genetic disease which causes malformation of one's red blood cells. The red blood cells are, of course, the cells that carry oxygen throughout your body. Now, this mutation certainly causes problems for the person who has it, and it causes anemia and can kill. Malaria is a disease spread by mosquito bites. When the mosquito bites the person, it inadvertently injects a single-celled organism called a protozoan. These protozoans get inside the red blood cells and eat the hemoglobin which is the oxygen-carrying chemical inside the red blood cell. Now, obviously, having your red blood cells eaten causes problems as well, and the infection gets into your liver and can lead to death. Obviously, neither case is a good thing. However, a person with sickle cell anemia, or even if they only inherited the sickle cell gene from one of their parents, and therefore they produce half sickle cells and half regular red cells, the protozoan basically doesn't have food. So the person tends to be resistant to malaria. In certain populations in Africa where malaria also runs rampant, there is a very high rate of sickle cell anemia. Why? Because the death rate from malaria is higher 
than the death rate from sickle cell anemia. So the people who don't have sickle cell anemia and are prone to contracting malaria wind up killed off at a higher ratio than those with sickle cell anemia. Now you can hardly call this beneficial, especially in light of the fact that the frequency of the sickle cell gene only hits about 18% of the population. Why? Because that's the percentage where the ratio of deaths from malaria and deaths from sickle cell anemia balance out. That's the ratio of which malaria kills more people than sickle cell anemia does. In either case, both diseases kill people, just in different ratios. In either case, we are looking again at a breakdown of the system. Now, first of all, only the female mosquito bites animals to suck its blood. If the mosquito uses its proboscis to bite a plant, it can fertilize one egg and it acts as a pollinator of the plant. It's a co-beneficial system. But in this present fallen world with a high mortality rate, by drinking blood instead of plant sap, a mosquito can produce hundreds of eggs instead. So you have a broken system causing an insect to bite humans. Something I would say was not seen in the original world. Secondly, as Gillen and Sherwin point out in their excellent paper, The Genesis of Malaria, the Plasmodium protozoa was probably a degenerate form of algae. Algae, of course, have a definite place and benefit in this world. So this is another case of a broken system. Thirdly, sickle cell anemia is a disease, not a beneficial mutation. It just happens to have a lower fatality rate than malaria. It also causes lots of problems with the person's lifestyle as they are continually starved of oxygen, even at sea level. But thanks for the excellent question. Well, I got to call that a wrap for today's show. I'm your host, Ian Juby, signing off for now. Please join us again next Genesis Week. Remember, you can send us your comments, questions, letter bombs, and proprietary plans for cold fusion reactors to us in a number of ways. You can email us at comments at genesisweek.com or you can send us a tweet at Genesis Week. Or you can head on over to genesisweek.com, which takes you to our YouTube channel. You can find the most recent show and post a comment there. Or you can head on over to our Facebook page at facebook.com slash genesisweektv. Remember those words of warning from our Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. We'll see you on the flip side. We are a viewer-supported program and need your support to keep this program on the air. Please pray for us, and if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to CORE Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, K2K, 2P4. While we cannot offer tax-deductible receipts outside of Canada, donors wishing to financially support the program can do so online at ianjuby.org slash donations. And thank you for your support.